I did want to say something about yesterday um, uh, and say it quickly. Uh, yes, I'm tired. I know you are too. Um, I'm just so thankful for a church family that, that comes together like what happened yesterday. And I kind of look at it like this. You know, you're standing at your popcorn station or, you know, your game that you're running or whatever you're doing and you're thinking about that. Or you're standing at the, the barbecue uh, serving table or the collection table and, you know, you're thinking about that. And I kind of think about it like this. I kind of look above and I just see it all. And what I want you to know yesterday, whether you're on the fall festival side or the barbecue side, is that the gospel of Jesus went out in many ways yesterday. Story time happening inside the slab, a story that was an allegory of the gospel. Um, gospel tracts that were given specifically to adults. Uh, every kid that got a candy bag got the gospel in there. Uh, Dallas Morales was there sharing the gospel and uh, with, with folks yesterday just under his tent and v interactions with them. Um, gosh, the gospel bracelets that Rachel and Donna were doing that explained the gospel. It was just so many ways to our personal conversations, you know, the, if you share, just to get the gospel out. And so an event, barbecue, festival inflatables and popcorn and all that kind of stuff that brought people on campus gave people a chance to get the gospel yesterday which was the biggest part of yesterday so I say that to say whether you were cutting up barbecue serving drinks passing out barbecue taking up money you know doing whatever you did on the fall festival side it was all a part of a greater mission to get the gospel in the hands of folks that we might see salvation and God do a work and so I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for the church family that, that came together to do all we did yesterday, whether you were holding a baby <laughs> or yet, so, 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 so people could work or serving or doing your part, and you just, it was a church family mission event yesterday, and it just makes me so happy and joyful. So thank you. Thank you so, so much for that. The other thing I want to say about 1 Peter is this, is that it was my plan to preach verses 1 and 2 today, but uh, let me tell you about Peter. Peter, before he can even get to, may grace and peace be multiplied to you, here's what Peter does. He's like, hey, there's this thing called election, and there's this thing called the foreknowledge of God, and that is a deep, deep subject. So I wanted to preach that today to you. But rolled up about Friday night, Saturday morning, as I'm still processing what I've been studying through the week, and I'm like, I don't think I'm ready to deliver that yet. So we're going to wait and do that next week. So we're just going to deal specifically with verse 1 today, two very important uh, parts of verse 1, and, uh, and we'll pick up with the lovely subject. And when I say lovely, I mean it's very lovely, of God's election and his foreknowledge of us. So look forward to next week. All right, so Peter, we looked at Peter last week. Um, just quick review, God called Peter to be his disciple. He said, if you follow me, I'll make you fisher of men. He changed his name from Simon to Peter, which means rock. Peter was just this great lover of God. He believed in God. He confessed Jesus as the Christ. He had many failures and mess-ups. He denied Christ on the night he was arrested, wept bitterly. Jesus restored him, said, look, you know, he had already told him, you're, upon your confession of me as the Christ, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build my church. And he told Peter after, he was re after Jesus was res resurrected that he wanted him to go feed his sheep and feed his lambs, and, and that's what Peter did. We see Peter living a restored, repentant life. The scared Peter on the night Jesus was arrested was not the scared Peter when he was preaching the gospel in Jerusalem where those plotted to, to kill Jesus. And we see him in the face of the religious leader saying, we're going to obey God, not you. We see bold Peter, restored Peter, repentant Peter. We see the apostle Peter. So today, just to get us going, 
The first thing I want us to see, I want us to focus on Peter's apostleship. What does that mean? Well, Peter, he, he describes himself, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, which I think is, is you know, after reading some of these folks, I agree. You know, it's, it's a very humble thing. Peter, obviously, is the leader of the apostles. He doesn't say Peter the apostle. He says Peter an apostle. Peter was one of the unique individuals to be called an apostle of Jesus. The apostles were the twelve, right? You remember there were eleven that Jesus, or, or twelve that Jesus called to himself, but after Judas, you know, the unfortunate events, the son of destruction, he's gone. He, there's eleven. But then after Jesus resurrected, Peter said, we, got, we need one more. We need to replace Judas. And they chose Matthias. So you've got the 12. And then you've got Paul, who was also an apostle. Those were and are the only apostles. There are no apostles today. Being a disciple of Jesus and being an apostle of Jesus are not the same thing. A disciple is a follower, a learner. An apostle of Jesus specifically were chosen by Jesus, sent by Jesus to be his representatives and to reveal his doctrine that would, listen, that would be the doctrine for all time for God's church. Apostles were and must be eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection. That was a crucial qualification when they chose Matthias in Acts chapter 1. Paul, even himself, saw the resurrected Christ. So, obviously, this describes no one today. The twelve and Paul, the apostles of Christ. These apostles were given divine revelation and divine authority as Christ's apostles. And this is what I want you to hear. It's their teaching, their teaching, based on the authority and the revelation of Christ that gives us the doctrine that we believe today. It's through them that we have the message of Jesus. Jesus told them, John chapter 14, 26, specifically to them, he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, listen, he... The Holy Spirit is a person, not a thing. So the Holy Spirit is not an it. He. Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, does the Holy Spirit remind us of God's word after we have read it? Sure he does. So that is, a, that is a wider application of this. But specifically, Paul, uh, uh, God, Jesus is telling the, the apostles, he's saying, guys, the helper, the Holy Spirit, he's going to come. He's going to remind you of what I have taught. And essentially, you're going to write it. You're going to teach it. And this is going to be the doctrine for the church. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the Holy Spirit gave God's teaching, gave this teaching, this doctrine to Peter and the apostles, and this is the doctrine that we believe and that we live today. Listen to Ephesians 2, 19 to 20, Paul's words. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, listen to this phrase, built on the foundation of of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So, the apostles' teaching given to them by God is the foundation of our belief. Remember, Jesus said that it's upon Peter and his confession of Christ that the church would be built and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. So upon Peter... And the other apostles who made the same confession, Jesus builds his church. So why do I spend time on that today? You're like, duh, yeah, or oh, yeah, what's the big deal? Two reasons why this is important. There's more, I'm sure, but two that I want to focus on today. One, because this letter of 1 Peter that we're going to be studying 
comes to us with apostolic authority. We already know that our Bible is the words of God. In the letter of 1 Peter, it's no different. It comes to us today as God's divine words from one of Jesus' apostles to whom divine revelation from God and divine authority from God was given. So we enter our study of 1 Peter soberly. These are the words of God through his chosen apostle. We enter it soberly, reverently, humbly, and somewhat excitedly. These are the words of God, the revelation of God that we get to know. We know we're hearing the word and the truth of God. And two, why spend some time this morning on Peter's apostleship? To be clear that there are no apostles today in the fullest sense of how Peter was an apostle. Now, there, the word apostle, little a apostle, generic term, means one who is sent. So in a sense, anyone can be an apostle. If mom hands you a letter to take down to neighbor down the street because you've written a note, you become an apostle of your mother, right? You're sent by your mother to someone with a message. You know, that's a generic form of the word apostle. In that sense, in some ways, we are apostles, uh, little a, sent by Christ. But in the sense of the apostles that laid down the doctrine that heard from God, divine revelation, divine authority, that's not us. That's nobody today. In the sense that Peter and the other apostles were apostles, there are none. There are no apostles today who hear special revelations from God that should be treated as new divine truth. All truth and all revelation from God has already been revealed through the apostles and those who wrote the Word of God. Doctrine is not still being revealed. Let me say that again. Doctrine, truth, is not still being revealed. It has been revealed already in the Word of God. So... Be very careful because many are out there that do this. Be very careful of those who say, God told me. And then fill in the blank. God told me. And I'm telling you, be very careful of that. You know why? Because when people say, God told me, this is essentially what they do. And they might not admit that they're doing this, but this is essentially what they do. They go, God told me, and I'm telling you. And so who becomes the source of the authority? Me. God told me, I'm telling you. How can you argue with that? Well, God, how do you know God said that? You don't know God. You, don't, you can't argue with that because it's subjective. It's their subjective reality. It's their subjective thoughts. It's our sinful thoughts. Sometimes we can have leadings and leanings and opinions and all this kind of stuff and emotions and feel really, really convinced that we heard the words of God, but they may not be. We need objective truth, not subjective truth. Be very careful of those who say, God told me, as if their words are the authority, instead of saying, the word of God says. That's what we need to be saying. Does God speak to us through the word of God? Yes, he does. The word of God says is our foundation of authority. That's what we share with others, not our subjective thoughts and opinions. The written word of God, through the pen of divinely inspired apostles and authors, is the source of divine truth, divine revelation, divine authority. Not our feelings, not our impressions, not our leadings, and not those of others. This is why we must be diligent and eager to read and study the word of God with urgency. If the word of God is the words of God, then we need to be, we need to study it. I'll give you two illustrations. Think about this. You just get an alarm system in your house. 
you got no clue how to use it. You just know how to punch in a code or whatever. Well, one day it malfunctions and it's just beep, 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 just all. And you're like, oh my goodness, I got to cut this off. So you don't know how to do it, right? So you run and you get the owner's manual, right? And you look at it and you're like, oh, if it does this, if it does this. Okay, this is what I do. This is step one, step two, push this button, do this thing. All right, da, da, da. And it's done. You're going to get that manual. Why? Because the person who wrote the manual knows how it works and wants you to know how to fix it. What you don't do is say, well, I think this is what the owner of the manual would say. Or, you know, you're in a, you're in, you're beep, 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 beep. You're not thinking, well, here's what I think needs to be done. Or here's what I think, you know, he means by this. So let me just try something. You know, here's my impression. Here's my feeling. I feel strongly if I do. That's not what you do. You go to the book to see what the book says. The one who has the authority. So in a sense... We need the Word of God. Why? Because there is an urgency about our living with hope in this world, holiness in this world. There is a B B B B B all around us that's just calling us to say, get to the book, live by the book, believe what the book says, believe the truth of God, trust in what I have told you, live the way I've called you to live. You be holy in this world. You trust in Christ in this world. We need this to endure to the end. But there's also a sense in which we should want to know it. And so here's my other illustration. You got, you got a, a military guy or girl who is stationed overseas, and only correspondence is through letters. He or she, newly married. Their spouse writes them. He or she doesn't just put that letter down and be like, yeah, I'll get to it later. No, it's... I want to know what the one who loves me most has said to me. I want to hear his or her words. I want to read them. I want to to read what they are telling me and what they feel about me and what they are, you know, informing me about. I want to know. And in a very real sense, this this Bible are the very it's, it's the very words of God from the one who loves you the most. We should want to know what he's told us. We should want to know what he has revealed to us. So there's a sense in which we need it because there's urgency, and we should want to know because it's love. See, Paul's hearers in 1 Peter, we're going to see, are dealing with persecution. They need the word of God, not the word of man. They don't need somebody's impression. They need what God has said to carry them and lead them through this time to hope and holiness in Christ, as do we. So don't waste your time on folks that say God told me. Dig into the Word. Listen to folks that say God's Word says. And you test it. Acts 17, 11, Test it to see that it's true. Peter's apostleship. But the, the, the other uh, thing I want you to deal with today, I want to deal with to, today, is the term exiles. Now, I'm very aware that it says he's writing to those he describes as elect exiles. So again, we're getting to elect next uh, week. But I want to just deal with the word exiles today. He calls the people that he's writing to exiles. Some of your versions may say aliens, strangers of the dispersion. All right, so Peter calls those to whom he is writing exiles, aliens, strangers of the dispersion. That word dispersion is diaspora. You think of dispersed, scattered. And these folks are in the areas of Asia Minor. This is modern day Turkey. We're getting close to Thanksgiving, no relation. So this term dispersion, okay? To those who are elect exiles of the, of the dispersion in these places, this term dispersion, listen, was used to describe the Jews who were dispersed, scattered away from Israel into other nations. Their past, you can read all that, how they were scattered and all that kind of stuff. But so this word dispersion was used to describe the Jews who were scattered away from Israel into other nations. So this leads some people to think that Peter is writing specifically to Jewish Christians. 
here who, who through the events of their nation's past that scattered them have found them away from Israel and in other nations. And in 1 Peter, we do find a lot of Old Testament references, a lot of Jewishness in here that would lend to belief that he was writing to Jews. However, we also find in his letter various reasons to believe that he's writing to Gentiles. I'll just give you references. You can go look at them on your own. Chapter 1, verses 14 to 18. Chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. That most people think he's writing at least two Gentiles and maybe predominantly Gentiles. And it would seem likely that many Gentiles in these areas in Asia Minor were, or many of these uh, uh, Christians in Asia Minor were Gentiles. So, again, most people think that it was primarily Gentile Christians to whom Peter is writing. Me personally, it's just I think it's safest to see that it was written to both Jews and Gentiles. If you look at some of the places that he's writing to, the people that he's writing to, some of these places, you go back to Acts chapter 2, I don't know the verse, but you you see the list, the description of the people that were in Pentecost on the day that Peter preached his sermon and all those people got saved. You see some of these these very places that people were from. So Jews that came from these places into Jerusalem for Pentecost heard the gospel And if some of those got saved and went back, would it not be unlikely that they took the gospel back to their homeland and that the Gentiles in their area heard the gospel and we've got churches in these different places that are a mixture of Jews and Gentiles? I think it's safe to say there's Jews and Gentiles that he's writing to. So this would lend us to think that Peter's description of them as exiles It's not about their political status. It's not about, hey, you are a person from Israel now exiled into Cappadocia. No, probably not that. He's probably speaking of their status as the people of God living in a world that is not their home. Strangers, aliens, exiles. His hearers... This, this, is a, this is a big deal, so just follow me. His hearers are believers. They are elected by God, chosen by God, according to His foreknowledge, sanctified by the Spirit, brought into obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. Next week we'll deal with all that. So, they're chosen by God, elected by God, brought into fellowship with God, brought into His church. So, as the Jews... Listen the people of God, were described as an alien, exiled, scattered people, the dispersion in a land that was not their own. So the new people of God, Jews and Gentiles, those who come to faith in Christ, chosen to be His, included in His church, are God's chosen people, aliens, exiles in a world that is not our true home. Those scattered all about the world who are a part of his people in Christ are true exiles in this earth. Heaven is our home. We are strangers here. This world is not our true home. So it's likely that Peter is using a word, dispersion, that was used of Jews, God's chosen people, to now describe the new people of God, God's chosen people in Christ, his church composed of Jews and Gentiles who have repented of their sin and come to faith in Christ. So, the Gentiles are a part of the people of God. This is big. I'll only spend a moment on it. You remember in Acts chapter 10, when Peter's praying on a rooftop and he gets a vision and uh, God essentially tells him, do what these men tell you, you know, they're, they're coming to see you say to do. And Peter's like, okay. And it was the vision of the sheep. And the, you can go, I won't go into all of it. But these men come and say, hey, we're from Cornelius' house. And Cornelius is a Gentile. Peter is a Jew. 
come with us. And Peter's like, okay, well, God told me to come with you, and I come with you. And he goes to Cornelius' house, and there's all these people here. He's a Gentile. He's not a Jew. Peter's a Jew. Peter tells them that it was unlawful for a Jew to associate or visit Gentiles. He, sa- he tells that to them in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. But now, long story short, he sees that God has included Gentiles in his people, in his church. So Peter has come a crazy long way from, hey, Gentiles are dogs. We can't even associate with them. We can't go in their house. He's come a long way from that viewpoint that Jews had of Gentiles to, hey, now Gentiles can be the people of God, my brother or my sister in Jesus, side by side, included in God's church. From those we can't visit to those who, who, who are our siblings in Christ. This, this is just a, <laughs> an implication of the gospel that's so beautiful. You know, when we come to Christ, obviously we're all sinners. God is a holy, righteous God who deserves our worthy worship and obedience and and he created us for his glory. He, he, he is holy and just and righteous, and he must punish sin. And the sad thing is we are sinners. And if he were, he, he can't bypass our sin. It has to be punished. It has to be dealt with, or else he's not just, or else he's not holy. And, but he's also merciful. He's as much just as he is merciful, and as much merciful as he is just. So from the human mind, that's a dilemma, right? How can he be merciful to me in my sin, but also be just and have to punish my sin? Well, the answer was Jesus. When Jesus came to this earth, who is perfectly God, in complete essence God, righteous, pure, in whom there is no sin, who perfectly obey the law of God, He hangs on Calvary's cross, enduring God's wrath for sin. God didn't take sin lightly. He didn't sweep it under a rug. He didn't say it's no big deal. He didn't say, okay, I'll just forgive you based on nothing. He said, I got to punish your sin. And so on Calvary's cross, Jesus is taking the wrath for our sin. And in so doing, he is upholding his justice. But he is offering you mercy because somebody paid for your sin in your place. And what seems like a human dilemma, God's justice and mercy fighting each other, oh, they're not fighting each other. They join together on Calvary to uphold his righteous character as just and merciful, to offer you forgiveness. And so when we come to understand, hey, I'm a sinner and I, tr- I, I need forgiveness, I hate my sin, I need to repent and turn from my sin, and I want to trust in Christ to be my forgiveness and to give, give me the righteousness that I need to stand before a holy God who hates sin. We receive his forgiveness as a gift. We receive his righteousness as a gift. We are declared just and right before God only because of Christ. And when we do that, Watch what happens. You not only come into fellowship with God the Father through Christ, but you come into fellowship with all those who have done that in Christ. So whether you're a Jew, a Gentile, whether you're a man, a woman, no matter what ethnicity you are, what age you are, what social status you are, whatever, those who come to God through repentance and faith in Christ, also are joined into one family in the body of Christ. The gospel brings us into fellowship with God and into fellowship with one another. You know, Jesus speaks of Gentiles. In John chapter 10, verses 14 to 16, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Listen, He's speaking of Gentiles here. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus is like, look, I'm bringing salvation to the Jews who will receive me, but I've also got people from another, you know, I've got 
from an, people from another flock that are going to be mine as well, and they're the Gentiles, and we're all going to be one flock, one family under one shepherd. So now, getting back to Peter here, Jew and Gentile, anyone scattered in the world who repents of their sin and turns to faith in Christ is a part of the people of God. And Peter describes us as exiles in this world. Believer, this world is not your home. Our citizenship, Paul says in Philippians 3.20, is in heaven. That's where our true citizenship is. We live temporarily here on our way to our real home. My sister at her church, she says her pastor uh, has described it this way, that this world is kind of like a hotel. We don't live in a hotel. We just go visit a hotel till we get to our real home again. Hebrews 13, 14. Listen to these words, church. We need this because we have such a grasp on this world and we don't want to let go. Hebrews 13, 14. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Of Christians, Edmund Clowney says this, they carry another passport. They are on a pilgrimage to the city of God. Mm. John Piper says this, Christians are aliens. If you're here this morning and you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are an alien in America. Your first citizenship is with Christ in heaven. Your second citizenship is in America, and the gap of priority between those two is infinite. End quote. So, some of us value our earthly citizenship more than our heavenly citizenship, and it shows. It shows in the way you vote. It shows in the way you talk. It shows in what you do. It shows in what your purpose is. It shows in what your... Your, your focus in life is. It shows in what you, you say to people and what you try to convince people of. It shows in your lack or devotion to the mission of God. Some of us value the things of this earth more than the things of God, and it shows. Church, we are aliens here. We are exiles here. We are strangers here. This world is not our home This citizenship, whatever your citizenship is all over the globe, is not your primary citizenship. Yet we live like it is sometimes. As exiles and aliens in this world, we are alien and strange to its ways. We've got to see ourselves that way. This world, I'm just going to, you're going to be like, well, duh. But then you're going to be like, well, why don't I live different? This world is in rebellion to God. It's in rebellion to God. Can we just admit it? This world is in rebellion to God. But we, as his people, worship and obey God. We we were saved, Titus 2.12 says, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. That's the opposite of what this world does, no matter how good or fancy or awesome we think they are. It's the opposite of what this world does. So... It is not strange for a Christian living for Christ in this world to be seen as strange. How can a citizen of a holy heaven like us not be treated as strange, odd, different, peculiar, alien in a world filled with ungodliness in all its forms? Whether it's graphic ungodliness or whether it's the accepted ungodliness. How can we who are holy citizens of heaven not be treated in an un, uh, as strange in an unholy world? We are different. We are new creations made alive in Christ. We are chosen by God. We live new lives, holy lives. I won't read these passages. I wanted to, but I'll just read one of them. One, chapter 1, verses 13 to 19. 
Therefore, preparing in First Peter, therefore preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, Peter's telling them how to live as exiles, as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. He jumps down to verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus saved us to be his. And to reflect who he is, we are different people. We live holy lives. Like Israel was known by its distinctive lifestyle. You remember they had all those food laws and those weird laws that just other nations were like, that is a weird country. They do weird things. Different things, peculiar things, strange things, odd things, alien things. Like Israel was known by other nations by its distinctive lifestyle, so we are to be known by our distinctive lifestyle, drastically different from this world. This is what Peter's letter is going to help us with. Our lifestyle uh, and declaration is a witness to this world. We're like a city on a hill that's shining a different light than the darkness of this world. So, here's where rubber meets the road, and I'm almost done. Do we look like aliens? Or do we look like the world? Here's our problem. We like to be like the world, and we like to be liked by the world. We want to live like the world, and we want the world to like us. And this is why we don't stand out as strange enough in a world that is in rebellion to God. So let's take a hard look at ourselves this morning. Does this describe you? Where do you need to be more strange and alien and peculiar? Where are you not? And I'm not talking about, you know, you know what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about being a goofball weirdo. I'm talking about being different. Where are you not pursuing holiness that is opposed to the attitudes and values and character and actions of this world? Where are you not strange, alien, peculiar? See, we are new creations. We're born again, he says in verse 3. We're made new. The, the old us, no, oh, it's at home in an ungodly world. But the new us, made alive in Christ, made a new creation, hungering and thirsting after repentance and righteousness, should not be at home in this world. We don't fit in this world anymore. We fit in Jesus. The things of this earth and the old ways of life, they don't fill us anymore. They don't satisfy us. They don't bring us joy anymore. Or they're not supposed to. Our true filling... Our true satisfaction, our true joy is found in who we are in Christ and pursuing Him. Pursuing life in Him. A believer in Christ is to be different. And we've got to see ourselves as different, exiles. We've got to live like it. We need to, be, we need to expect to be seen as strange. Why? Because we're strangers. We need to expect to be ostracized. Why? Because we are exiles. We need to expect to be seen as alien. I'm not talking about E.T. or Yoda. We need to expect to be seen as alien and foreign. 
because our home is not of this world. And once we get it through our thick skull and our thick heart that this is who we are and who God has called us to be, then we won't be looking for so much approval and affirmation from the world, and we won't see it strange that we are treated as strange and suffer persecution and suffering for our faith. Schreiner says this, believers are exiles because they suffer for their faith in a world that finds their faith off-putting and strange, end quote. But though we suffer here, we know our true rest, our true comfort is not here. It's in our glorious future, our inheritance with God in eternity. So it's for that city that we wait, enduring the lifestyle and suffering of an exile on this earth with joy. And as we wait, we need to appear strange in our hope, our holiness, our words, our conduct, and our purpose so that we shine like a city on a hill that people may be drawn to see why we are so strange. And so we may tell them about the God who saved us in Christ, that they too may have opportunity to be saved by God in Christ. Glory to his name. Amen. God, you are good. You are so good. You could have left us to be at home in this world to suffer an eternal destruction away from you. But God, you saved us out of this world. So God, loosen our hands from our grip on it. Fix our minds and our hearts and our focus to realize, accept, own the identity of a citizen of heaven that we may live like it, that we may show others of the abundant life that you have given exiles in Christ. That the strange life, though very strange to them, is a beautiful, glorious, forever wonderful life. God help us, though we are in the world, not be of the world.